So I thought what I might start with is something of an attempt at a definition. I don't think definitions are necessarily that important, except that when you have a community of practitioners coming together, there seems to be a thread that brings them together. And um, in this case, building on some of the research done by my colleagues around the world, I've put something together, rather, you know, going out on a limb here, and building on the recent work done by Ross Smith, Parle Palsa, and Kristen Fischer, and some colleagues of mine in Australia. And I've come up with animated notation, and the animation I'm going to be talking about today is a predominantly graphic music notation that engages dynamic characteristics on screen media. And the reason that I'm using screen media here is because I think it's an important connection with the idea of animation um, that's different from other times of dynamic notation uh, and um, brings a lot of these practices together. I actually believe that this kind of notation is yet to be embraced by most of the music community as a valid form. And for electronic performers particularly, it holds enormous potential to direct and illustrate electronic sound in live performance. The aim of this keynote today, I guess, is to convince you of that. Music notations have always benefited from advances in technology. And I'd propose that after the printing press, the next biggest development in the realm of music notation was the computer. Printing presses offered the possibility to make duplicate copies and disseminate music faster and more widely. It was also the beginning of the musical work, existing as something quite separate from the act of performing, an important development to the way music was approached for hundreds of years after that, and only recently been readdressed. But the technology of the printing press had its limits, of course. Carlo was difficult in mass production, and fine detail took many years to become a reality. Printed music is bound to a variety of structures that are not particularly flexible, and I'm going to talk about some of those today. Despite its limitation on the page, traditional music notation has gone largely unchanged for almost 250 years. It served the purpose of depicting melody, harmony, tempo, rhythm, dynamics and structure well. It fared less well in terms of describing textual quality and became excruciatingly apparent at the advent of electronic music and recording technology. When tonal harmony began to be picked apart, traditional notation struggled to adapt thereto, and composers stretched in all sorts of radical directions to compensate. To my mind, the final blow to the efficiency of traditional printed no musical notation came around the middle of the last century when a kind of perfect storm was established between new musical sound worlds, mostly electronic, performance approaches such as improvisation, the integration of cultures, uh, practices from other cultures and computer programming, and of course, recording. When the microprocessor brought on the explosion of personal computing in the late 70s, the technology for notation and disseminated of notated music changed again. Computing facilities uh, facilitated approaches that defied music notation as something that was fixed, that is a kind of fine and only version of a work, something that had already been explored in the 50s New York School and elsewhere. Generative and interactive notations flourished as computer processing power grew, but the foundations of music notation did not change as rapidly as we might have expected despite all these developments. And given the potential for digital dissemination and screen presentation of music notations, we see relatively little of it. The experiments with open compositional approaches and aleatoric practices that had been refreshed through the interest in graphic notation in the mid 20th centuries didn't seem to flow readily into computing in any significant way. Notation programs on computers instead focused on facilitating the creation, duplication, editing and sounding of traditional music notation, with more recent developments seeing tablet computers typesetting hand-drawn conventional notation on the fly with programs such as Music Inc and Inkspooler. The binding of notation programs to MIDI specifications has also contributed to its limitations. Color, strangely, is relatively rare in music scores, for example, as are embedded audio and other, control, uh, other content or control messages. The enormous ongoing struggle over publishing rights has prohibited legal fluid distribution of digital source. <clears throat> and commercial hardware add-ons to facilitate notation rarely go beyond notation that, uh, sorry, rarely go beyond Bluetooth page turning pedals and screen pens. And so, to my mind, animated notation is the most exciting notational development that links the graphic notation experiments of the 1950s with the possibilities of computing. <clears throat> so I have to talk about this thing right here, up front. The contemporary art climate is an interdisciplinary one. Many, dis many musicians resist that. Many freelance musicians also work in a range of different fields, giving rise to the idea of what Dawn Bennett calls the portfolio musician. Collaboration has become an important 
as it has become important across all artistic disciplines and many individuals trained as classical musicians end up writing for and playing in film scores, works for dance or theatre, game music, they curate programs, they create and make sound installations and usually take part in free improvisation at some stage in their career. We soak up design and images in this media heavy, visually dominated world and many musicians transition in and out of the art world through a variety of projects. Something's happening with the sound here. So this is an example of visual music, starting with what Roger Fry in 1912 called the translation of music to painting, and moving into film was an early intermedia form that usually involved visual artists working with music, but sometimes the other way around. Literally converting images to sound on film soundtracks, artists such as Otto Fischner's Ornament Sound Experiments and Mary Ellen Booth's Seeing Sound Films explored the interaction of the physics the vision of music outside the realm of notation. They were not looking for mechanisms to communicate sound ideas to sound makers, rather they were exploring the way sound could be expressed in images. may be the only time you hear list in the conference. <clears throat> These explorations into a visual language of expression for sound was not that, uh, that was not music notation or important and predate some of the more radical graphic notation experiments that push the boundaries of performability. Recently, books that showcase graphic scores for their pure visual aesthetic have had success and YouTube is overflowing with visual representations of electronic works. These all contribute to an environment of interdisciplinarity where developments such as animated notation can occur and flourish. Some animated notation relates strongly to the idea of visual music in that the scores are film-like in nature, but their intention is very different. This score, uh, this is an iteration of the score Sariat for toy piano and electronics made by Palo Palsen in 2013 and is an example of that kind of relationship. And a disclaimer, I'm a composer that uses graphic and animated notation. I didn't study art, I studied classical music, and though I have a vibrant interest in it, and it contributes to the design and inspiration for many of my works, um, it's, I'm not an artist in, in the visual sense. Probably, most literally, in this work, which I'm going to show you, by, uh, of my own, which is very much inspired by Sol Levitt's wall drawing series. This is for string quartet <clears throat> and theremin and electronics. <clears throat> it's the first in a series of ensemble works with electronics that my piece in the concert tonight, Pure, also belongs to. I rarely showcase the screens to the audience, the, the scores to the audience, unless it's in a scholarly environment like this conference. Audiences often don't appreciate performers back as, as they look to a screen, and I've worked out how to avoid that, and showing the score is like giving away the abstract nature of music and its wonderful, mysterious passage through time. Plus, I've no pride invested in the way these notations look. They serve a purpose, and I stand by my claim that the scores I make are created primarily and fundamentally to transmit information to the performers. Sure, I make choices about things in the score, like colour, that are not driven by any sonic imperative, so I can't say that I totally ignore the aesthetic qualities of the notations either. Clay and Freeman's definition of real-time notation sounds a lot like animated notation, and it's why my definition has used predominantly graphic notation as part of it. I believe this distancing from traditional notation is a key to animated notation's applicability. Interactive programming environments have led to a range of possibilities for music composition. Elements of improvisation and a broader acceptance of aleatoric aspects in music have been crucial to, and I would say even nurtured by, digital processes. 
Change can happen at a range of different stages in the work, the composer's conception, the performer's realisation, or both, or at different points on this kind of scale. Real-time composition focuses largely on the compositional end, and computer programmers often operating within a range of choices generate diverse outcomes. That is, we hand some of these choices over to parameters we set in a computer program. These outcomes could be notational as well as core sound or effects drivers. And importantly, these kind of processes can be executed in real time or just be preset and triggered. That is, the outcome of the processes may be unknown or known at each iteration, depending on the intention. So is there a need to notate these elements of a composition? Or is the programming interfaces researchers such as Sorensen and Magnussen attest a score already? It would depend on the function you'd like it to have. And given the rapid evolution of software and to date the lack of support for superseded versions of software and hardware, I'd argue that a score other than the program itself is required to communicate the desired aim of that program beyond its first performance. And if the composer wants the work to remain performable beyond the life of the tools engaged to create it in the first place, or beyond constant updating while the composer is still alive, and let's face it, we all hate that, I think a score is a good idea. And so the key here in some ways, and the thorny point, I would say, is around precision. How do we score generative computer music programming so that it accurately de depicts the fine intricacies in the work? I believe the answer lies in creating the score in the conceptual stage of the work. I've made some experiments in this area myself, and I wanted to empower electronic music performers with scores that enable them to make choices about how best to engage their instrument, the computer, just like other musicians do. In other words, scores that describe what the programmer should do, not how they do it, or on what program. Here are three examples that explore notating electronics in ensembles with acoustic instruments, and they all involve live sampling and the performance to some degree. This is another work for string quartet and live electronics. Each musician has a pickup running to a computer which processes the sound at certain points in the score and sends it back out to a bass amp behind each performer. I've got an ongoing interest in low frequency sound. Each instrument is sampled where notated on the score. A fraction of a second, very precisely placed and found on the score, is recorded and transposed immediately to a pitch selected by the operator or program within the range I've provided in those black squares. And it's played back through their bass amp in the dynamic and textural information that I've provided in the score. Black is a clean sound and the hatched kind of effect indicates a distortion that's at the choice of the operator. This one here, Kuklinski's Dream, is for three instruments, bowed knives and electronics. Here are the three textures of notation that are the basic instructives for the electronic musician, which are these ones down the bottom. It's very simple, really. One designates recording the instruments during the time specified, the other playing back the recording that's been made unaltered, and a third indicating the playing back of the recording with effects at the choice of the operator. These re reappear in the score throughout. And continuing on this zone of recording idea, this work, Erst, provides a score for a spatializing electronic artist. Each instrument here has a color. The pizzicato clouds are derived from bee swarm activity. And the page is covered in an opaque, when the page is covered in an opaque color, the microphone for that instrument is activated and the section recorded. It's then played back through a speaker in an array of the operator's choice at the end of that opaque color. Sometimes the colors overlap. I think you can see that happening here, which means two instruments may be recorded at once. And each iteration of the score is different. This piece is another sampling one, where the point indicated precisely on the score again is a point of sampling and playback, like in Cruel and Unusual. But here the tone is converted to a sine tone of the same pitch the instrument performs, which is different at each performance because I don't notate the pitch. The tone gradually wanders in in, around that pitch as illustrated on the score. This wandering can be automated or performed in real time by the computer musician. The acoustic performers need to relate their choices to the movement of the electronic parts proportionally, but the electronic parts are actually very precise.
These scores communicate the intention for electronics in the works, and the performer can use whatever program is available or familiar to them. Each time the pieces are performed, results will change because the score leaves many choices for the performers. But they're always identifiable as the same work. They're examples of what we call scrolling scores, where the score is actually a fixed image, sometimes even printed and published as a paper score, but performed using a mechanism to facilitate the coordination, the coordinated reading of it. The mechanism I'm using here is the Decibel Score Player, an iPad app my ensemble, Decibel, devised together in 2012 after some years modelling the scrolling presentation technique in Max MSP, like other artists had been doing. The performers instantiate the scroll as it traverses the vertical line, what we call the playhead. Multiple iPads can be networked and it can have one image in a series of parts. The playhead idea is not new, of course. It's used as a way to follow traditional notation and it's the default way to orientate listening in most audio programs. But in the 2000s, quite a few artists were experimenting with this idea as a way to read graphic notation, even if the playhead was just the left hand of a video screen. These works that I've just showed are very two-dimensional and all that's generated by the score player is the motion of the score past the playhead and many of them could be just read from a video file. But I've got others that engage a range of aleatoric elements, of organisational elements, meaning that there's never a final version, substantial conundrum for notation that aims to preserve the work into the future. Generative animated scores provide a range of possibilities that relate directly to Freeman's real-time composition idea of constructing components of the score in real time. Winkler compares real-time scores to a TV or a movie and conventional scores to a book, paving the way into thinking about scores as moving with the fluid motion of a video. He refers to new possibilities of control where the responsibility of the composer is not lost but changed from a builder or an architect to what he calls a creator of potentialities. These works are likely to have notations that are drawn on for performance in conjunction with a computer program and to execute the audio and sometimes the notation. Eric Maestri suggests a topology of notations from the perspectives of their performance, dividing notation into past, present and future types. The past involves the reconstruction of a recorded sound event, the present is an actual concrete performative moment and the future is represented by traditional notations. Real-time compositions represented as animated scores definitely sit in the present. Animated notation can only assist with the dilemma of the program sitting behind a kind of grab bag of notation parts if the composer is happy to accept an open quality. Graphic notation excels at providing parameters for exploration, but what we'd call generative animated notation, that is, images generated in real time to be read as instructions for music making, binds the score much more closely with the program. David Kimboyle and Pedro Rubello provide interesting generative works that operate in a deeper, more three-dimensional space. David Kim Boyle's point studies number two is constructed and performed in Max and generates audio and a score. Two performers, each with their own rotating images, read the coloured nodes in the score as pictures and takes the changing sizes of these nodes as dynamic information and the collecting lines as durations between each of the changing pictures. Kim Boyle refers to, refers to scores like this as kinetic structures as they constantly move and evolve. The score material and the audio playback both created in real time, are intrinsically linked and inseparable. <laughs> Pedro Rovello's score for NetGraph uses PlayStation. PlaySpace, a real-time graphics rendering engine developed by Rubello and King and engages a network performance with musicians in different countries reading his animated notation, which involves some objects that are three-dimensional and are read from different perspectives in different locations. It's hard to imagine this concept of exploring an object from different dimensions and places around the world using any other kind of score. And whilst animated notation embraces both real-time and fixed notation practices, it's most likely to embrace a larger degree of aleatoricism than other, most other notations. It's important here to differentiate aleatoric elements from the free-for-all or guided improvisation. Many scores leave some choices to the performer but are very clear and precise about others. Again, there's a range of freedom for each element of the composition at different moments in its formation and performance. Brian Halmarsen's Constellation is a program that generates a score, a static score. As with many earlier works using traditional notation, the generation is done beforehand and makes a version for performance. 
scores also delivered as code to be rendered in the software node box. This composer also provides printouts of the score on his website to illustrate what performers may expect. You can choose to have a flat version or a moving one. Hagen Marsen has been active as part of a group of composers in Yurakovic, Iceland, that have been pioneering animated notation since the early 2000s as part of a composer's collective, Schlatter, and me member Palle Palsen's blog, animatednotation.blogspot.com, is a collection of animated notation from around the world that I highly recommend to you, alongside Ryan Ross Smith's animatednotation.com. Explorations of pre- and post-performance aleatoricism are, common, are very common in animated notations. In this piece, I wanted to disrupt the linear dynamic activation of the score. As with any other kind of real-time composition, there's no final version of this work, just a template that can be cut up and represented. Liminum is a work that starts simply by scrolling from left to right, but then it's disrupted by jumping to random parts in the score several times. Each iPad starts and progresses through the piece in unison, and each performer's score will jump at the same time, but to a different point in the piece. This activity is bookended by unison material, unison in that each performer plays the material, but they choose their any pitch in which they want to do so. The harmony, therefore, is created completely by chance, and starting pitch is referred to throughout the score with that grey line you see to orientate the performer. And another paradigm, this work is just used, literally used as a shuffle mechanism. A duo for two percussionists, the slides are shuffled differently before each performance and presented on two networked iPads. At times they join together for some duo slides and the elapsing time and dynamics are randomly chosen from a range provided. The hard copy of the score is in fact a series of cards and the piece could be played from them, but again, the score player is used to coordinate the performance and the animated aspects comes primarily from that coordination, if I stay with my definition I made earlier. Other works use computer processing in more fluid environments, creating some of the most innovative and animated notations. They can be used to realise electronic music where, like the Kim Boyle example, the score is also connected to the electronic sound generation or may just be used to instruct any kind of instruments. The work of Ryan Ross Smith, a lead researcher in animated notation, who's sound checking his piece right now, provides a good uh, example of this. This is just the score for study number 48. The work is developed in the program processing. A very prescriptive and active kind of avatar directs the performers as to what to play. The performers learn from a, a range of sounds to play the piece, but the order of the sounds will be different every time and they move between one and another very quickly, picking up on Freeman's extreme sight reading notion. Yet the piece sounds remarkably static to the audience with a sense of flatness and formlessness. It has no end, not unlike a merry-go-round that keeps turning until you decide you want to get off. The score is sometimes delivered as a rendered video version, so whilst the work assembles in real time and can be done so in a performance, it doesn't necessarily have to happen at the same time. And this is addressed by the composer undertaking a range of versioning by releasing videos of score iterations with a catalogue number. John Cage, of course, pioneered these different elements of aleatoricism in the variation series and other works. Variations 1, for example, requires the performer to assemble the score beforehand and then play it as a fixed finished score. Unlike Ross Smith's work, the score's variations provide materials to be assembled as a kind of reading by the performer themselves. And that reading is only fixed and finished for that performer and at that performance. They may even reassemble if they don't like the way it turned out. My Ensemble Decibel made the Score Creator app for the complete set of Cage variations and it digitally renders the organisation and reading of the assemblage instantaneously and more accurately. The graphic representation derives from conventions of other graphic scores around the time the work was composed and put into motion for a more coordinated performance. Height being pitch, width being volume, shade being textual density, length being duration, the numbers are Cage's events. These are almost standards in graphic notation. Each reset creates a new iteration, as you saw a little bit earlier, <clears throat> and the works are open instrumentation, meaning that any electronic performer can interpret them and often do. But the pioneers for the dynamism in animated notation surely come from other composers, such as Earl Brown, whose explorations with mobile forms and mobility of elements forms an important starting point for dynamic notations aside from the video experiments of visual music. Inspired by connections with the art world, most importantly Calder's mobiles, the New York School were able to push musical ideas and notations in different directions. In fact, it's worth noting that Brown did discuss ideas for a motorised version of December 1952 in his seminal reflection on the work in American music, 2008. 
Brown saw the possibility for a more urgent and intense collaboration with performers as both an aim and a result of dynamic and changing musical forms and relationships. Another important and underestimated pioneer in this field is the Australian composer Percy Granger, whose notated free music works are some of the first graphic notations in the 20th century. These examples bring up important aspect of animated notation, the possibility it holds for reading works from the past. Whilst the focus of this discussion is on creating new work, its principles can be applied retrospectively. Decibel's work with the cage variations is one example, but the principle could be applied to the bountiful works that exist for instrument and tape that could easily be put into motion, for example, in the decibel score player, like this one from Dennis Smalley from 1985 for clarinet and tape. This example was created by Decibel member Lindsay Vickery to eliminate the need for a stopwatch or memory to play the piece. The Decibel score play enables sound to be embedded into the score file, and so any work that have a stereo playback can be republished as a digital score where the audio score are lined up precisely as in this example and shared openly. Despite a surge of artists embracing electronic music, both as composers and performers, the possibilities for notating electronic music remain relatively restricted and, as most of the examples I've provided here, rely on open instrumentation works. Whilst attempts to notate spatialization and use graphic scores to assist the analysis of electroacoustic music have had success, specific uh, notations intended for electronics are actually remarkably rare. Electronic music has brought about a different time-space dimension for music and moves emphasis away from metrical restraints and toward proportional parameters, which you can see in my works, um, which are presented effectively in animations. Laptop orchestras have been pushing notation for electronic music in different directions as well, and they often incorporate physical gestures, a key aspect for the work, another notational challenge. This piece by Ross Smith for the Laptop Orchestra Plork is a score that's also sounding the piece, like the David Kim Boyle episode earlier, but the piece is just these sounds. But laptop artists each have a copy of the score application and listening to each other becomes a key methodology for the successful performance because they're able to move shapes with the cursor to create different sounds at different times. This refined sense of musical listening means that animated scores are not an easy option for composers or performers and a reason why they're not necessarily ideal tools for teaching music either, I would say, although there are plenty of examples out there. A trained music ear, trained how, I hear you ask, is a key to understanding the proportional relationships in these works, where parts come together and move away. Scott Hewitt's feedback slide is an example of a laptop notation. It's not animated, but addresses some of the issues around scoring and performing electronic music. It's literally as directions for faders, leaving the movement and speed and pace up to the performance. If it was animated, that may be fixed. Hewitt expresses frustration at the excellent notational paradigms for computers, saying that the composer is forced to opt for either precision in a limited number of parameters or a broader direction of intent. Again, this struggle with aleatorism. He goes on to question, to question performance at all if the machine could just be programmed to do what the composer wants. This is a common concern and many laptop orchestras go for the body rather than a mouse or joystick control through Wii and other hardware controllers to provide dramatic performative effect. However, animated notations offer the possibilities of decision making on the fly if you need it, drawing stronger parallels to instrumental performance than computer programming and retaining the element of live, the engagement of live performance we're so familiar with. This liveness that's so seductive in performance makes part of all graphic notation and is retained with animated notation. But that's not to say they can't or shouldn't be rehearsed. Performers can access examples of previous iterations of generative scores and usually have instructions to assist them decode and memorize symbols if need be. And these symbols are often common to other works by com different composers. Many animated scores use color as a way to identify parts, as in my works you saw earlier, or pictures. But what if we standardize colors to pictures? This could be a challenging uh, proposal. There's been some significant work done in design around sound and drawing, famously investigated by the Buba Kiki experiment here. It around color and sound outside synesthesia and personal color attributions is um, not as well known more broadly. The use of colour in animated notations is quite random and at best aestheticised, with some composers engaging similar colour palettes across their oeuvre. Density is another area for exploration. Do we want our scores to look like they sound? 
This oral engagement with the image may be one of the issues regarding notation, notating electronic parts. Like, really, do we know how to draw them? What Rubillo calls interactive interpretation and Ross Smith calls the field of possibilities seem to be part of the anim animated notation pact. I'm losing my ability to say animated. Mm. Animated notation pact. What Hubenstock Ramati thought as a discovery of material and invention of form is being built upon here. An ever-expanding range of middleware that can enrich score files means that scores need no longer remain static flat objects, but can, just as text has been revitalized with HTML, scores can come alive with embedded control messages and audio. The electronic and notation parts need no longer be separate. This has as much importance to the preservation and ongoing engagement with music from the past as it has with music yet to be made. Moving through time, or scattered across it, distributing across time zones and physical landscapes, animated notations can assist us to challenge our perceptive notions of time for music and sound more generally. Thank you.